Oh, beloved, I am so excited. I have a surprise for you today. That surprise is I am not teaching. Now, don't say, oh, no, what's going to happen? Well, my son, David Arthur, who's our new vice president of teaching and training, is going to be doing the teaching. And like others, you may say, I'm disappointed until you hear him. And then you're going to say, hey, didn't miss you because I got the word explained to me in power. Hello, my name is David Arthur. Has your mother ever said to you, son, daughter, listen to me. I have something to tell you very important. You know that what she says next is going to be serious. We have today in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 51, a message from God. He says three times, listen to me, pay attention. Join us today as we hear what God has to say. Several times in our text today, we're going to see God say, listen to me. It's a pretty understood fact that when God says, listen to me, he's trying to get our attention. Three times he says, listen, pay attention, give ear, uh, listen up, Israel. I have a message to tell you. What is that message? Come with me to Isaiah chapter 51 and we'll look at it together. The first one I want to take you to is verse 1. Verse 1 starts off with that verb, listen. He says, listen to me who pursue righteousness, who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who gave birth to you in pain. And when he was but one, I called him, and then I blessed him and multiplied him. Now, these first two verses, what we have here is God saying, listen to me. What is he asking him to do in this listening? Well, the first thing he wants them to do is he wants them to look to their origin. Look again down at the verse, beginning in verse 1. He says, look to the rock from which you were hewn. Go to where you came from. Look to the quarry from which you were dug. And then he defines that in verse 2 as Abraham. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who gave birth to you in pain. Well, oftentimes when God wants to encourage us, He wants to take us back. He wants to take us back into history and remind us. To show us His past history tells us that there's something we can trust in. There's a God whom we can rely upon. He's proven Himself. He says, and you notice what He says about Abraham and Sarah. He says in verse 2, When He was but one, I called Him. And then I blessed Him and multiplied Him. Uh, there he's referring to uh, Abraham when Abraham was uh, an old man with an old wife. Uh, he approached Abraham and said, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. And from you will come descendants like the sand of the sea, like the stars in the heaven. And I will bless the whole world through you. But there was a problem. Abraham was an old man. Abraham was past the time in his life when he was to have children. And yet God says, remember. Look to your origin. Look backwards and you will see. The second thing that he tells them in this listening is that he, we are to be comforted. Look what he says in verse 3. Indeed, the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. And her wilderness he will make like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. This is a theme that we see often in Isaiah. It's a theme that describes God as saying, listen, I want to take you back. I want to take you back to the original design. And if you were to go to Scripture, if you looked at the, the whole Bible in one big picture, you would see at the beginning of the Bible a tree in the Garden of Eden. It's the tree of life. If you read through the entire Bible and you get to the very last chapter in Revelation, you see that same tree again. The story of the Bible fits between 
these two trees. Literally, though, it's one tree. It's a tree that says, I am the God of creation. I am the one who takes small things and makes them big. I am a God who blesses those who, quite honestly, don't deserve my blessing or even expect my blessing. And God says, listen, I want you to listen up. And here's my message. Be comforted. Oh, what a great message for us. To be comforted, how does he base that on? Well, he's already told us to look to your origin. Look to the rock from which you came. Look to the quarry from which you were dug. Remember Abraham? Remember Sarah and how he brought them from a womb that seemed to be dead. He brought an entire nation that he blessed and that he carried through. And now he says, be comforted. Be comforted. Well, what's the source of that comfort? Well, he tells us in verse 3 that I am going to restore you. Look what he says. Indeed, the Lord will comfort Zion. How will he do it? He'll start with her waste places, her wilderness. What will the wilderness look like? He says the wilderness will be like Eden. Do you remember Eden? It was the garden where God, there was no sin. It's where the Lord daily walked uh, with Adam and Eve. It's where creatures had the right position, the right relationship uh, with man. Man was in dominion and man was, was uh, fulfilling the earth and fulfilling God's mandate on him as his image bearer. It was perfect. It was the way God had designed it. It was his pattern for creation. And God says, I have a message of comfort for you. A message of comfort that starts with one, looking at your origin, but two, and know that I will restore you. I will take your waste places, and I will make your waste places like the Garden of Eden. Like the desert, he says in verse 3, the desert will be like the Garden of God. So what does that look like? What does it look like when the garden, when deserts become gardens? What, is, what does it look like when non-Eden goes back to Eden? The end of that verse tells us this is what will be found in her. Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and a sound of melody. Thanksgiving and a sound of melody. I love that. It's marked. His restoration, his comfort is marked with joy. It's marked with gladness. It's marked with a sense of song in the heart. You know when you've got a song in your heart. It's something you, you can't keep down. You can't keep it out. It's, it's joy and pleasure bubbling its way out of your chest, out of your heart, out of your lungs. You sing out to the Lord. He says, this is what my comfort will be like for my people. There'll be joy and gladness in their hearts. It'll bubble forth in songs of melody, songs of thanksgiving, a reverential understanding that God is the one who comforts. This is the first time he tells us about listening. Now, what I want you to do, if you're following along in your Bibles, I'd like for you to mark the word listen or any, any phrases that are similar to that. So if, uh, if you'll take uh, what I do is I, I draw a real simple drawing of an ear, uh, just a little half moon shape and then a little dot in the middle uh, for your ear. And I just draw that out next to the word listen or give heed or pay attention, uh, that, you know, different phrases that do that. And I'll, I'll draw that out there, uh, and, and you, you will be able to use this kind of marking system uh, as you study through the Bible. Uh, if you've not done it yet, I would encourage you to go to preceptsforlife.com where you can download a free study guide that we have prepared for you to assist you in your study of God's Word. Now, let's look at the next one. Verse 4 tells us the next mention of listen. It's actually here described as pay attention or to give ear. Uh, let's read verse 4 together. Pay attention to me, O my people, and give ear to me, O my nation. For a law will go forth for me, and I will set my justice for a light of the peoples. My righteousness is near, and my salvation has gone forth. And my arms will judge the peoples, and the coastlands will wait for me. And for my arm, they will wait expectantly. Okay, a couple of questions we need to ask the text. First, who is he talking to? Who is he telling to pay attention? Who is he telling to listen up? Well, if you look back down at the text, you see in verse 4, he describes them as my people, my nation. We understand from the context of Isaiah, this would be Judah or the people of Israel, God's covenant people that he has brought out of Abraham, as we've seen earlier. 
So he's talking to his people, to his nation. Why does he say, listen? Why does he say, pay attention? Look at verse 5. He tells us something is near. Something is coming. Look what he says. Verse 5, my righteousness, God's righteousness, is near. My salvation has gone forth. There's a sense of expectation now. There's a sense of anticipation that God is bringing something. Pay attention. Be alert, he says. Give ear. It's what, what our, my mom would say to me when she knew she didn't quite have my full uh, comprehension of what the instruction was. She would say to me, David, give me that look. Sometimes she would use my middle and last name. I know I was in trouble when that happened. David Lee Arthur, listen to me. There's something coming. Now, in my case, it was usually a punishment or a mandate, you know, clean the room one more time, uh, one of those things. But here in Isaiah 51, verse 5, in Isaiah 51, verse 5, he says, listen, my righteousness, the thing you've been waiting for, the thing that I have designed, the, the gift from me that reunites my people to me, the thing you're going to need to have the thing you're going to need to cling to desperately, my righteousness and my salvation are near. Be in expectation. Well, what does it look like? Two things I want you to see here again from the text. In verse 4, he says, My law will go forth from me. This is going to be a manifestation of his righteousness and of his salvation. He first describes it as his law going forth for him. Well, what would that law look like? The next phrase tells us that it will be like a light for the nations. A light is something that exposes. A light is something that illuminates. A light is something that says, listen, there's something important for you to see. You need to be aware. A light for the nations. Well, what is that light? He says in verse 4, I will set my justice for a light of the peoples. If you've been studying along with us on Isaiah, you'll remember Isaiah chapter 2 tells us that is what is going to come out of Zion. That is what's going to be part of the manifestation my light will be my justice that I will set for all the nations. And then he says, secondly, look around you. Just look around you. The coastlands will wait for me. The peoples will be judged. He says in verse 6, lift up your eyes to the sky. And then he describes all these cosmic things. And he says very simply, they will vanish. If you're going to listen to God, sometimes you have to, you have to look around. You have to compare it to the message that you're hearing from the world and from those around you. And as you think about, as you think about what God is saying, He says, I, I want you to know my salvation, my righteousness is near. And there's going to be a temptation to look around and to place your trust or to be, have a have reason for anxiety from other things that are, that are competing with my message. But I want you to know something very clearly. They will vanish like smoke, but I, my salvation will never end. Welcome back. I'm so glad you're studying the book of Isaiah with me. As we saw earlier, God had said, listen, I want to comfort you. Part of my message is a message of comfort. And part of that message you will receive when you look around you and see reality through my eyes. We saw earlier that he said, look at those things around you. They will vanish like smoke, but my righteousness will be forever. Let's continue to look at that. Look with me at verse 7. I love this in verse 7. He says, listen to me. Here I go. You want to mark it again with a little ear. Listen to me, verse 7. You who know righteousness, a people in whose heart is my law. Here's the message. Do not fear the reproach of man, nor be dismayed at their revilings. Why? Verse 8. For the moth, he says, will eat them like a garment, and the grub will eat them like wool. But in contrast, my righteousness will be forever, and my salvation to all generations. Okay, so let's back up and look at again the text. We see in verse 1, he says, to listen to me. We see in verse 4, pay attention to me or give ear. And then in verse 7, he says, listen to me. All three times is a message of who he is 
and who we are in relationship. Listen to me, he says, I want to bring you comfort. Start by looking at your origin. Remember who I brought you from. I brought you from Abraham and Sarah. I made a nation out of an old woman and an old man past childbearing age. And I will bring to you comfort. I will make you like the Garden of Eden, he said, the Garden of the Lord. I will bring you back to restoration. And then he says, my law, and the second one, my law will go forth uh, like a light for all the peoples. And that his righteousness and his salvation are to be expected, anticipated that they are coming. But then he goes on to describe uh, the, the looking around in verse 6, as we've recently seen. He says, lift your eyes up to the sky, then look to the earth beneath. Uh, he goes on to say, for the sky will vanish like smoke and the earth will wear out like a garment and its inhabitants will die in like manner. But again, in contrast, my salvation will not wane. Now, verse 7, who is he talking to? He says, listen to me, you Here's the answer, who know righteousness. Well, what does one who knows righteousness looks like? Well, one who knows righteousness, he says in verse 7, is a people in whose heart is my law. Reminds me of God's promises of His covenant. He says in His new covenant, which will yet to come in Jeremiah 31, He says, it'll be a covenant in which I will write my law literally on their hearts. My law will be part of who they are. It'll be part of what they're, what they're about. I will write my law in their hearts. But he says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to listen to me, and I want you to listen very carefully. I don't want you, he says in verse 7, to fear the reproach of man. You see, Israel is about to go into exile with Babylon. Now, this has been prophesied already to, already to the people of Israel in the book of Isaiah that Babylon exile is coming. But he wants to remind them, even in exile, even when you're taken by this powerful pagan nation of Babylon, do not fear. Do not fear the reproach of man. Why is that, Isaiah? Well, he tells us because they're like, it's like a moth eating a garment. It's like a, a grub that eats wool. Uh, man will not last. So what will last? What can we rely upon? He says in the end of verse 8, it's his righteousness. My righteousness will be forever. My salvation to all generations. Now, we have in verse 9 the next mention of listen, except this one's a little different, isn't it? Look at verse 9. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the days of old, the generations of long ago. Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a pathway for the redeemed to cross over? What's he doing here in verse 9? Well, here the, the listen is going from God. It starts off with God to the people. But now in verse 9, it's turning it back around. This is the people's response back to God. This is, this is often done in the prophets. The prophets speak back to God what really should be spoken for the people to God. What is the message? Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. We've seen this reference to arm already, right? Let's look at chapter 51, verse 5. He says, My righteousness is near, my salvation has gone forth, and my arms will judge the peoples. Uh, we, uh, later on, he says, The coastlands will wait for me, and for my arm they will wait expectantly. Now, I've got written down in my cross-references a couple of verses you might want to explore. Chapter 52, which we'll see later on in verse 10, it's mentioned. We'll also look at chapter 53, verse 1. But each time it mentions arm, he's talking about strength. He's talking about uh, power. In, in the Hebrew context, the right arm was the arm of power. I have this friend. Uh, his name is R.V. Brown. R.V. has been called by God to do evangelism uh, to kind of the hardcore uh, folks in the inner city, to, to the, the down and out, to the rough uh, folks, folks who are desperate. Uh, and his, his technique's pretty simple. R.V., uh, played professional football. RV is a, an enormous man. Uh, he has biceps. The last time I checked were 25 inches around. That's, I mean, that's, those are some guns. 
An RV, his, his technique is very simple. He walks into a public high school in an inner city. He has up on the platform a bench press with 500 pounds mounted on it. The, the bar begins to bend at the weight. RV, without saying a word, walks up, sits down on the bench press, and pumps out five, six, up to ten times 500 pounds. Immediately he has their attention. Immediately, there's not, you know, does this guy have legitimacy? Is this guy, you know, does he know what he's talking about? Because of his strength, he now has an audience. The people of God are saying here, they're saying, wake up, awake, O Lord. Now, not in an irreverential manner, but in a calling out based upon your promises in the covenant, Lord. Would you wake up? Would you bear your arm of strength? Would you show your manifestation of your power? Would you manifest your power? Would you show who you are with your strength? Now let me show you what he says. He says, uh, he gives a couple examples. Uh, In verse 9 he says, Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces, uh, who pierced a dragon? Uh, There he's referring to Job 26, verse 12. And Rahab, uh, not Rahab of uh, Joshua's time, but Rahab was a Canaanite deity that that lived in the sea and it was known for her power and her manifestation. And if you go back to Job 26, you'd hear Job reminding his Eliphaz and the other guys talking to him that God is a powerful God. He is the one that stirs the seas. He is the one that cut Rahab into pieces And pierce the dragon. He then says this. Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a pathway for the redeemed to cross over? There he's referring to the Red Sea crossing in Exodus as God supernaturally split the Red Sea to deliver his people. So what's going to happen? In verse 11 he says, So the ransom of the Lord will return, and here it is again, and come with joyful shouting, and everlasting joy will be in their heads. They will obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. The conclusion is this. The ransom will return. God has a message for His people, and His message is this. Listen to me. Remember from where you've come from. Remember who I am and my power. Listen, pay attention, and give heed. For I have a message of comfort, a message of salvation, and my righteousness is near. Are you ready for His righteousness, for His salvation? God promises in His message of Isaiah chapter 51 that He is a God who has a message of comfort. But it's not a message of comfort for everyone, is it? It's a message of comfort, he says, for those whom I have redeemed. For those who are expecting his righteousness. For those who are anticipating his salvation. God has manifested his power throughout history. He has reminded us of Eden. He's reminded us of what he did uh, to Rahab and the sea. He's reminded us of where he brought his people from, from Abraham and from Sarah. A message of comfort. Indeed, the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. And her wilderness He will make like Eden. The result of that is joy. Joy and gladness, thanksgiving, and a song in the heart. A song of melody. Let me ask you, my friend, do you know that comfort? Is that comfort that what is spoken of in Isaiah 51 foreign to you? Would you like to know more about what it means to be ransomed and redeemed? God's Word has the answer for your situation. God, through His Word, even though He's speaking to us through Isaiah and to His people, He is talking to you. And in His Word and in His inspiration, He wants you to know that there is a message of comfort for you. And that we are not to be fear of man. We're not to be afraid of our circumstances. In fact, he says, I want you to look around. Note that they will vanish like smoke, that they will, are empty and frail. But my righteousness, you can count on. My righteousness is forever. My righteousness will never wane. That means it has no ending. 
That means it has no expiration date of which God will eventually pull the plug and say, that's it, no more righteousness. His righteousness is everlasting. His righteousness is a message of comfort. A comfort that, that he says takes things like a desert and turns them into a lush, beautiful garden. A, a garden that has, rep, has the fingerprints of the Creator all over it. Let me ask you, my friend, do you know this message? Are you familiar with the author? His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And He has told us He is coming back. And with Him, He brings His reward. And with Him, He brings His salvation. Are you ready for His return? Are you ready for a message of comfort? The message is powerful. The message is transforming. And together in inductive study, we can find it for ourselves. And we can meet the author together in His Word. Will you join me? Thank you for watching today. Join us for our next program as we discover more Precepts for Life. Are you familiar with the author? His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And He has told us He is coming back. And with Him He brings His reward. And with Him He brings His salvation. Are you ready for His return? Join us for our next program as we discover more Precepts for Life.